started. Welcome everyone to our virtual Bye Bye Buzzard event. Um, this is an event we've been hosting for a number of years here um, with Dr. David Pearson as our lead. This year, as you all know, looks a little different um, being digital, but we're hoping um, to still have a similar experience, um, not here in the garden and not seeing uh, the birds live, but we're hoping this will fill in till we can all come back together again. So welcome Dr. David Pearson, as you all probably know from years past. Um, he's a research professor at ASU with areas of expertise in biodiversity, ornithology, ecology, and sustainability. So I'll let you take it away. Thanks for being here. Okay, I'll share the screen here. Oops, post disabled participant machine. I can't share the screen yet. There we go. Okay. Okay, welcome everybody. I wish we were all here together, right, looking at those cliffs, but as you know, we've got to do this uh, virtually. So imagine yourself there standing or sitting, and there we are looking at those great uh, birds up there on the cliff in a nice sunny morning. <clears throat> I know some of you have been there before. Uh, by the way, uh, did you hear about the turkey vulture who got on the airplane with no checked baggage? Only had carry-on. Okay, I won't go much farther than that. Yes, people tend to boo and hiss a lot. Okay, at any rate, uh, here's what it'll look like next time when we're together face to face. Anyway, so just imagine yourself here watching these birds in action, and let's see what we can do virtually as far as getting some some uh, know-how about what's going on with these vultures and and why they're so important to us. Uh, there they are, sitting up on top of that cliff right there at Boyce Thompson. And uh, about this time of morning, they're starting to all turn their backs to the sun. It's like almost a sun worship, and they raise their wings with their back to the sun. It's a wonderful sight. And uh, again, uh, this right now is the best we can do, but hopefully uh, it won't be too long before we're all back together again looking at these things in, in, uh, live. And then they, they take off in a, in a matter of maybe a half hour from now, they'll be starting to take off as soon as the thermals start forming and starts warming up a little bit, uh, moving high up into the sky. Uh, a wonderful, wonderful sight. Uh, everything we, we can think about it in nature, these turkey vultures really exhibit a, a, a wild part of, of a habitat that's, that's still there for us to, to enjoy at Boyce Thompson. So some, some details about turkey vultures, just a few. Uh, the scientific name is Cathartes aura, and, and that's a fun one because Cathartes has the same root as cathartic, to clean, and aura is referring to golden, uh, the, the, the head is kind of golden colored to some people, and uh, that's where it gets a scientific name. Uh, these turkey vultures were called turkeys because I guess the people way back uh, maybe the pilgrims or whoever way back there weren't good bird watchers, and they figured they saw them walking around. They looked kind of like turkeys when they were walking around, walking around, but they certainly don't look, look like turkeys when they're in flight. And there are a lot of birds called vultures in the old world, in Africa and Asia and in Europe. Uh, they are called vultures, but actually they're, they're in a different family. They're not the same family as our family of vultures. These are more closely related to eagles and hawks. And if you want to really impress your friends, you can call them the Accipitridae family. There will be no tests, so don't worry about having to remember that name. So old world vultures share many of the same characteristics as our new world vultures, but they are uh, only distantly related. Our new world vult, here are all the species in our family, Cathartidae, of the new world vultures. Again, uh, they are a different family. They're, they're fairly related to the hawks and eagles, but they are a different family. And, and sometimes people have actually put these closer to the storks. And you can see everything here from uh, uh, black vultures and turkeys and lesser yellowheaded, greater yellowheaded. Here's the, Andi uh, the Andean condor, that's the largest one, king vulture. And then the other one, we have three members here in Arizona. Here's the California condor, which we probably should start calling the Arizona condor up there at Grand Canyon, has been reintroduced. Uh, the black vulture we have here in mostly southern Arizona, and the turkey vulture throughout Arizona, especially in the summer. Now, the, the 
the two vultures we have very, very commonly right here in central and southern Arizona are the black vulture and the turkey vulture. Uh, the black vulture has an all dark gray head. It has these white outer tail, uh, outer flight feathers. It does a lot more flapping. It doesn't soar quite as much. And when it soars, it has a flatter uh, wing pattern. The turkey vulture has a much has much longer wings, has a longer tail, of course, the reddish head, and these kind of silverish wing linings. And it flies with, with its wings kind of held up in what we call a dihedral angle. So they aren't held flat, they're held up. So in their profile, you can tell a turkey vulture a long, long ways away. Black vultures are very rare at Boyce Thompson. I don't think there's more than one or two records. They're quite rare. But the black vulture is moving farther and farther north, perhaps with climate change. We're not quite sure. Uh, it doesn't get much uh, much farther north than, than uh, Phoenix. It's about as far north as it gets now. But uh, we could expect it to be showing up a little bit farther north towards the Mogollon Rim eventually. Turkey vultures, on the other hand, uh, in the summer especially, are throughout the state. Now, I have to somehow take umbrage at calling them buzzards. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to refer to vultures as buzzards, but properly, this is the buzzard. The European counterpart to our red-tailed hawk is called a common buzzard. And buzzards are, in general, these, uh, these hawks in the genus Budio, the same as our red-tailed hawk. So you want to be totally correct. A buzzard is actually a hawk and our vultures are not buzzards, although that's often used as a common name. Again, early on, a lot of people couldn't distinguish vultures from, from hawks, and they'd come from Europe where they're calling them buzzards, so they continued calling the vultures buzzards. Anyway, we can keep that straight. So let's stick with vultures and make sure that the buzzards are really referring to these European uh, red-tailed hawk types. Now the life cycle of turkey vultures, kind of fun. Uh, they'll nest in cliffs, or here's one in a cave on the ground, uh, two to three eggs. They will sometimes nest in trees on cliff sides. Uh, and look at these wonderful chicks. Aren't they beautiful, though? Wouldn't you like to caress and hold them up? Uh, the clutch size is one to three eggs, and they, they incubate the adults incubate the eggs uh, for about a month, and the nestlings are about two to three months being fed in the nest till they are able to fledge and leave the nest. Now there's something that, that looks really obvious, but it's amazing how well turkey vultures hide their nests. And I've never seen a nest. I've never in my life seen a nest. As common as turkey vultures are, I've never found a nest. And I have very few of my birdwatching friends who actually found a real nest of turkey vultures. They are extremely good at hiding their nest, keeping them obscure, or on a cliff edge or places where they can't be seen very well. Again, they could be susceptible to raccoons and other types of predators coming in, and they are able to hide them very, very successfully. It also makes it very hard to study because they are extremely hard to find. And doing a survey of nests of turkey vultures would be an almost impossible job because they're so hard to find. Now look at some of the turkey vulture adaptations. Here's a side view of the, of the side of a head of a turkey vulture. And we, we, we know from captivity, they can live at least 17 years. And probably in captivity, they live longer than they would in the wild. They have a, a body length of about two and a half feet. And their wingspan from tip to tip is about six feet. Now think about that. A bird with a six foot wingspan, how much would you guess it weighs? 20 pounds? 15 pounds, 30 pounds? Well, the weight, four to five pounds. They're mostly feathers. They have hollow bones and they're very, very light, which makes flight much, much efficient, more efficient. If they weighed 20 pounds, they'd have to have a 15 or 20 foot wingspan to support that amount of weight. So the, this is typical of all the birds, but especially these, these soaring birds. And they have very, very reduced flight muscles. Uh, to keep that weight down, which means they can't flap very much. They do not flap very much. They do. A, they depend on soaring. And if you force a turkey vulture to flap a lot, it'll get exhausted very quickly and have to come down because it doesn't have the big breast muscles you're used to seeing in a, uh, on, a, on that uh, Thanksgiving turkey and all those breast muscles. Uh, they have very, very small breast muscles. And a big part of that is uh, to keep the weight down and the trade-off is they're dependent on soaring and not on flapping flight. They can flap for short distances, but don't very much. Uh, notice these, these adaptations too. 
uh, the, the bear head. Anybody guess why they have a bear head? We all, okay, we'll say bear. Uh, why do you think the, 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 there's been selection for them to have no feathers on the head? And it's typical of almost all the vultures, both old world and new world uh, groups of species. Think about that for a little while. Yeah, I'm sure some of you are coming up with it. And, and uh, what we find is that if it had all kinds of feathers, where are they sticking their head all the time? In dead bodies and dead skunks and dead dogs and gore. And if they had all that gore all over the head with stuck on feathers, it'd be very hard to keep it clean. It would interfere with a lot of their functions and seeing and hearing. But by having no feathers, it's much, much easier to, uh, to, to keep it clean. Look at that, look at that nostril too. That's very unusual amongst birds. A big open nostril for breathing. Uh, it doesn't have a septum. It's, and most birds, it's just a small little hole with a septum separating the two sides. In this case, it's wide open. And as you might guess, it's for the same reason. When they're sticking their head in all that gore, it's much, much easier to snort and get that gore out of there with this big hole. It won't, uh, won't interfere with their smelling ability, which they are. They're one of the few birds in the world that can smell very well. So they need to keep that open. And this is an effective way to do that. We also, have a question feet. that's come okay, through. Okay, question. Shall yes, we? so it's, do they nest here in the summer or during their winter home down south? No, they do not nest in the south uh, when they go down to Central and South America. They only nest here in North America. This subspecies, we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes, because the turkey vulture ranges all the way to South America, but there are other populations that migrate from the southern Argentina up to the Amazon, the opposite direction, the same species. So uh, we'll, we'll talk about that too, but it's, it's a really wide ranging species with a complex of different populations. Good question though. Look at the feet of all these different types of hawks and, and, and buzzards and eagles, things that are very, very predatory. And then look at the turkey vulture. It's a weak little foot. It doesn't have sharp talons. It doesn't have sharp claws. The vulture doesn't have a strong bill. It can't tear things that are alive or have just been killed. They can't tear them apart like a hawk or an eagle can. It can't hang on to them with its feet. It can't claw into them like a, a vulture, I mean, like a hawk or an eagle could. So what happens is the vulture can only eat things that are already falling apart. They're already rotting and falling apart. Imagine, imagine the adaptations to have that kind of diet. They cannot eat things that have been freshly killed. They cannot get to them and tear them apart. Oh, defense. Think about what vultures, how they defend themselves. And if you ever get close to a vulture, sometimes we have uh, some of the groups bring vultures, injured vultures out to the Bo uh, Boyce Thompson to look at. Uh, they're okay with most people, but if a dog gets close or some animal gets close, you quickly see why you don't want to get too close to a wild turkey vulture because they can projectile vomit up to two or three meters away. And just think what they've been eating, dead skunks, dead dogs, and all that stuff gets all over. It's a very effective way to keep predators away. Now, I want you to listen very, very carefully. Everybody be real quiet now, and I'll play the voice of the turkey vulture. Here it comes. Everybody hearing it? No, because they don't. They don't have a voice box. They don't have a syrinx like most birds are. Uh, at best, they can hiss, but they don't have any voice as, as far as voice, uh, as kind of vocalizations. Thermal regulation, uh, keeping their temperature down, especially here in the desert. They have a very effective way if they poop or defecate on their legs and feet. And that's quite often why you see turkey vultures with a very, very white type of legs. That's not the normal color of the legs. That's that uh, uric acid that they have in their defecation. And they defecate on their legs. Uh, that moisture then keeps their legs cool. And a, a lot of the blood vessels in the legs then carry that cooler temperature up to the rest of the body. And it's a really good way to keep themselves cooler when the temperature is very, very high. Also, we find that early in the morning when they are cool, they'll turn their back. And we see this over and over again on the cliffs there at Boyce Thompson. All of a sudden, they all start to turn their back towards the rising sun. And spread. Their, it's almost like a religious thing. Look, like they're all praying or something. What they're doing is they're spreading their wings out and they're absorbing the, the, the heat from the rising sun uh, from, and when it's a little bit cool in the morning, especially 
warming themselves up. And that means they can save energy. They don't have to use their own internal energy. They don't have to burn up any fat or glucose to keep themselves warm. They can actually use this external source of the sun. Almost like a lizard using the sun as an external source to keep themselves warm. They are warm blooded, but uh, they're doing some lizard tricks here too, uh, using this external source of the sun. Now, there's an alternative. Some people think that this may also be a way, especially when they do it in the middle of the day, of roasting off their feather mites. There are all kinds of feather mites, uh, hippobosids and types of lice running all through those feathers. And uh, being exposed to the open sunshine may be a way to drive those lice and other types of parasites out of the feathers. Another possibility, uh, I like the thermoregulation one a little bit better, but it could be both. We have another question that's come through. Okay. Do turkey vultures eat dead turkey vultures? Huh. They are not above eating each other. If, there, if something's, When something's dead, uh, they don't really distinguish. If it's really dead and smelling bad and decomposing and they can eat it, yes, uh, they will go ahead and eat other turkey vultures. Not a lot of, a lot of cases of that happening, but uh, it, it can happen. Good, nice question. Now, as I mentioned before, turkey vultures are really unusual in another sense in that they have this extremely good sense of smell. And what they can smell is a thing called methyl mercaptan. And you have all smelled methyl mercaptan. It's a chemical that's given off decaying bodies. It's a chemical of de uh, decomposition. So when bodies have been dead long enough and are decomposing and the bacteria and other things that begin to decompose them, this type of chemical is given off. And you know the smell well because our natural gas has that very same chemical in it, methyl mercaptan. And the reason is natural gas by itself has no smell. And if a gas were escaping, you wouldn't be able to smell it. So gas companies have, got, have had to insert methyl mercaptan as a detection possibility. So that when gas is being emitted, and, and it shouldn't be, you can smell the methyl mercaptan that's been placed in the natural gas. Combination, uh, what's going on? Now, the same methyl mercaptan, the tur turkey vultures can smell small amounts of molecules of methyl mercaptan up to 70, 80, 90, 100 miles away. That's how sensitive their sense of smell is. They're picking up methyl mercaptan in the air. When they smell it, they'll start to circle and try and follow a strengthening uh, detection of methyl mercaptan downstream to its source. So they actually use the methyl mercaptan to find at long distances dead cows, dead skunks, dead anything that's really beginning to decompose and give off this gas. Great, great technique. Now, when they get close enough, they then start to use their eyes to locate where this is. And you find out that other vultures miles away are watching other vultures. They can see because when a vulture goes down, the other vultures get the message, oh, look at that neighbor vulture over there. He must have found something. And they use each other then, and all of a sudden all the vultures would begin to congregate around the one vulture that found the, the, the dead body. Handily enough, in Texas they learned that there were large congregations of vultures gathering around the natural gas pipelines at certain points. And they finally figured out there was a leak in the pipeline at that point. And the vultures were telling them this is where the leak is because they were all attracted to that same methyl mercaptan that was escaping from the natural gas pipelines. It was a very effective way for the companies, very cheap way for the companies to detect leaks in their very, very expensive natural gas pipelines. Another useful use of the turkey vulture. We have another question that came through. Good. Do they share food or fight over it? <sighs> Quite often what we find when you get a lot of vultures around, first of all, if both black vultures and turkey vultures come to the same carcass, and the turkey vultures often find it first, the black vultures move in, they are more aggressive and they'll actually drive the turkey vultures away. If it's only turkey vultures, quite often they, uh, they, they form a kind of a, uh, 
who, who's, who's most aggressive, the, 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 the alpha person or the alpha individual, the biggest one, usually a female, uh, will be able to have the first dibs. And then they, they work down the ones that are younger and smaller, have less and less chance to get in until later. So they do form some types of, of uh, communities that way where some individuals get more of a chance first. Then when they're full, uh, they have to move on. Now also remember, if a turkey vulture eats too much, it can eat two, three, or four pounds of, of that carcass of a cow, for instance. It has a hard time getting back in the air because it's so heavy. So they, they can't gorge themselves too much, so they try. Uh, those, are all, those are all kind of trade-offs. So they can't be there forever. They're going to leave. Then the next individual can come in and start eating. So in some ways, they do share, but it's not a very polite way of sharing. And now, then we have one things. more. OK, one more question. Good. Sure. The hatchlings were white. When do they begin to turn black? And do juvenile turkey vultures have black or red heads? How old are turkey vultures when their head, the red head shows? Oh, great question. The young vultures are, have the, these white downy feathers uh, until about, uh, they're about three months just before they're ready to fledge. So about three and three and a half months. And when they leave the nest, they have a dark head. They don't gain that red head until probably their second year and females gain it before the males do. I might also add, during the courtship, that red head becomes bright red in the males. And the amount of blood flowing through that uh, head with no feathers to co cover it up is an indication of their uh, a willingness to, to mate. And, and also it gives the females a, a signal that I'm a very, very uh, good male and I've got good genes. So uh, it, it's, uh, and the young ones will probably keep the dark heads for, again, males, uh, probably a year or two, females probably about uh, eight months to a year. Okay. And then one more. This one says, respectfully, I think it's ethyl, not methyl, mercaptan. Huh. In terms of the smell. Okay. I'll have to look that up. All right. Okay. I'm not a chemist. Uh, okay. I will look that up. All right, uh, aggressive mimicry. Uh, at Boyce Thompson, there is another bird called a zone-tailed hawk. And in flight, now you look at this, you say, yeah, they really don't look alike. But at a little bit of distance, they both fly with this dihedral. Uh, they both have that silver wing lining. You can't see the white banding on the tail. And the, the color of the head is not real obvious at a distance. Now, why in the world would a zone-tailed hawk look so much like a turkey vulture? Uh, it's, it's just incredible. And uh, what we find is quite often the turkey vultures are flying around in big flocks. And if you look carefully, especially on a Boyce Thompson, regularly you can see a zone tail hawk actually flying right in amongst them. Our best explanation for this is that turkey vultures are not dangerous to squirrels and other prey items. They don't eat live things. They don't chase live things because they can't tear them apart. They only eat dead things. And if a squirrel got, uh, got the message every time a turkey vulture flew over, oh, there's an enemy, and they dived underground, there's so many turkey vultures, the poor squirrel wouldn't have a chance to feed. So they learn, oh, that's a turkey vulture. I can tell by the shape. They actually learn to identify turkey vultures. And they look up and say, oh, it's OK. That's just a turkey vulture. Well, who's flying with the turkey vultures? is a zone-tailed hawk who indeed can capture with big talons and a sharp beak live organisms. And the poor squirrel looking at the turkey vulture is fooled and thinking the zone-tailed hawk is just one more type of turkey vulture and gets nailed. So we call that aggressive mimicry, where the turkey vulture is the model and the zone-tailed hawk is the mimic. We, there's a little bit of arm waving because we don't have a lot of really good data. No one's put out types of different types of prey items and actually gotten quantity of data. But it's a nice story and, and very likely it's probably got a lot of aspects of it too that, that are valid. Now let's talk about flight. I bet you didn't I realize that you were gonna learn a little bit of physics here. Bernoulli's principle. This is how turkey vultures can get up there and soar for hours, all hours and hours, all day long with no flapping hardly at all during, tw during 12, 13 hours of flight. Very efficient way to fly. And they depend on Bernoulli's principle to keep themselves, as all birds do, to fly. 
And Bernoulli's principle similar simply is when you have laminar flow, that is, there's no turbulence involved. This is just flat flow, laminar flow over a surface. The faster that flow of air over that surface is, the lower the pressure. The slower the air goes, the higher the pressure. We call it an inverse relationship. And look at the cross section, the shape of a wing. It's the same for an airplane, the airfoil type of shape in which it's rounded and curved on the upper part. That means as air encounters the front end, leading edge of the, of the wing, it has to go up and over the top of that wing and it goes faster to get to the other, to the other trailing edge than the wind going under the wing, under the flat part. That means then all of a sudden you have higher pressure under the wing and lower pressure above the wing and that produces lift. Now remember, this is only with laminar flow. If you have turbulence, Bernoulli's principle falls apart. Any kind of turbulence interferes with this relationship of lower pressure with higher speed and, and um, uh, the, the higher pressure with low, uh, lower speed winds. Now, I, I've gotten into this with physicists. I didn't realize that there was so much controversy. I thought Bernoulli's principle was established. It was there. But there are physicists who scream and yell, no, 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 it's not Bernoulli's principle, or it's not only Bernoulli's principle. There's Coanda's effect, which is the flow of air or fluids over curved surfaces. There's Newton's law, which says every action has an opposite and equal reaction. And these physicists really get all bent out of shape, uh, saying it's only Bernoulli's principle. Uh, let's see, let you know of how little we really know of what is causing this this, this ability to fly, but it's a, probably a combination of those things. And if you want to really look at the effect, whether it's Bernoulli, Kwanda, or Newton's, or a combination of all those factors, try blowing over a piece of paper like this. Okay, go ahead. Go. All right. So we saw that when you have air going faster over a surface, we'll say it's, it's Bernoulli's principle because that's the most common one. Uh, the air pressure is, is goes down and that gives lift, again, only in laminar flow. Now we also talked about the dihedral. That is, uh, uh, most hawks have a fairly flat, most hawks and eagles fly with fairly flat wings. But the turkey vultures have very much developed this flight into a dihedral in which they always have their wings up in a broad V shape with the wingtips spread like that. And what we find now when we look at this, again, looking at fluid mechanics, is that this is extremely effective, especially at slow speeds. And off the tips of the wings, you are inevitably going to have some turbulence. That's where a lot of turbulence is produced. It comes off the tip of the wings. And that really interferes. And if you're going fast, it's not quite so much of a problem that the laminar flow really going fast over the wings uh, kind of overcomes that bit of, of spiraling turbulent air coming off the tips. But at slow speeds, which turkey vultures have to use when they're, when they're flying, trying to find that dead carcass, they don't fly very fast. They have very, very slow flight and they're very efficient at using that slow flight especially low over the ground. Sometimes they come way down low over the ground looking for those dead carcasses that they've been smelling. Uh, slow flight's the way to do it. And the dihedral is very, very effective in minimizing the turbulence coming off the tips of the wings and, and helping them make these slow flights quite effective in the, in the, in the way of, of getting the air pressure differential. We have a thing called biomimicry in which engineers and biologists get together and they study these, these natural situations uh, like we see here in turkey vultures, uh, adaptations. And is there a way we can take advantage of that? Every one of you has seen this dihedral effect, especially at slow speeds, on the airplanes. It wasn't long ago, maybe you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, in which airplanes didn't have these winglets on the tips. They had flat wings. We know that that, especially at the slower speeds of takeoff and landing, uh, produces a lot of turbulence, which can affect what's going on. The conventional wingtip, large vortex coming off the tips of the wings, 
that created a lot of drag and caused problems in takeoff and in landing especially, but even in straight flight, it, it, it made the plane use a lot more fuel, for instance, it was much more inefficient. Looking at the turkey vultures, these engineers decided, wait a minute, if those birds can do it and be much more efficient, let's make our planes into a partial dihedral and adding this blended winglet that we see. Next time, if you ever get on an airplane again, I'm not sure when I'm next getting on an airplane, next time you get on an airplane, look out the window and you see these winglets are actually getting bigger and bigger on the new planes. And what that does now is it reduces this wingtip vortex right there and makes the plane much more effective in takeoff and landing at slow speeds, but even at cruising speeds makes them much more efficient and they use much less fuel. And it's increased the, the range of, of different airplanes. It, it can add 10, 15% to the range on the same amount of fuel, just by adding that one little thing that people learn from the dihedral turkey vultures. Turkey vultures get up with, as you've seen, uh, they, they form these big groups we call a kettle, a kettle of, of vultures or hawks or eagles. Uh, and you see them circling very, very tight circles. They aren't spread out in a broad band. They tend to be in a, in a very, very tight grouping here called a kettle. And what we find out is turkey vultures use rising columns of air, which are very common, not only here in the desert, they're more common here in the desert than as you go farther north, but even in Minnesota or Alberta, you can find these rising columns of air form are spiraling up and these turkey vultures spot these, they're able to detect them. Uh, one vulture will find it and start rising with no flapping at all. They go up and up and up. The other vultures say, oh yeah, there's a column and they all move over to that same column. They'll rise two, three, four, five, six thousand 6,000 feet up into the air. And then when, especially when they're migrating or moving around and they can move hundreds of miles in a day, if they're in their territory, their territory is immense because they can move such great distances without flapping. And what they do is they're able to detect these columns of rising air, move up in them, and then they will coast, they will glide. And as you glide, you're not flapping, but you're losing altitude, and they'll glide down to the base of the next column, then rise up in that column, and then rise up, and then leave that column and glide to the next column. Again, they can move hundreds of miles without flapping once. It's super, super efficient. And when they're migrating, they can cover hundreds and hundreds of miles in a day also explains why they can't migrate at night. Also is an indication they can't migrate over the ocean. The ocean doesn't produce these rising columns of air. So they're really restricted to, to going over land using these columns both for local territorial movements and for long distance migratory movements. Very, very effective. And also if you're in a tight circle like that, you're not gonna be using fast speed. You're not going to going, going real, real fast because you'd be out of the column too fast. So you have to have adaptations that enable you to, to soar very, very slowly. Again, that dihedral enables them to stay up in the air and very effectively use the rising columns of air together with Bernoulli's principle with a dihedral to be very, very efficient and effective. Now here comes the question that's, okay, question, Shelby? Oh, I thought you were yeah, we have some questions that came through. Okay. How do they detect the rising air? Ah, I forgot to mention that. That's a great question. Now, you all seen dust devils, right? Those dust devils are a way to see the rising air columns. Those are, those are some ways. So they can detect, they can actually see the dust rising. Uh, they can see leaves. They can see detritus rising. Uh, more often than not, though, when there's nothing else rising, Sometimes one vulture or a raven or a hawk, another hawk, will come across the column by chance. And when they do, they start circling. And all the other vultures for miles and miles around can see and detect, oh, Henry over there has found a column. I can head over there. So they use each other that way as well as rising detritus. I might also add that uh, a lot of uh, glider pilots, uh, gliders, as you can see here down here, uh, use the same columns. That's how they rise up uh, when they're moving long distances. And I've talked to some glider pilots who also use vultures and eagles to find these rising columns as well to get in there and, and get, get altitude. <clears throat> what we're finding more and more now is plastic. 
white plastic is a way they're filing these columns and other garbage rising. So unfortunately, uh, our garbage is, is, is taking on another, another function as well. Great question. We have two more. Um, I see turkey vultures in my neighborhood, New River, year round. Does this mean my local birds do not migrate? Yeah, if you live in New River or if you live uh, uh, out there in East Mesa, uh, at some of the, uh, there's a, a retirement community out there, uh, we're finding over the last 10 years, turkey vultures have started spending the winter here. Uh, they don't have, don't have Boyce Thompson, and I'm guessing Boyce Thompson has enough altitude that it gets too cold in the winter to have sufficient amounts of rising air for them to, to get up. Uh, and what we're finding probably as the winters get warmer, it's been a long time since we had a lot of frost here in Phoenix, and it may well be another indication of climate change that they're able, uh, I mean, think about that, it's a smart thing to do. Why migrate all the way down to Mexico uh, when you had to before because it was too cold and, and nothing uh, was unfreezing and you couldn't find enough food and there weren't enough rising columns of air? As things warm up, there are more rising columns of air so they can actually move out during the middle of the day. And also uh, the climate change is warming so the things that die are actually starting, instead of freezing, are actually starting to putrefy and provide food all year round. So that, that's my best guess of what's going on and why we're probably seeing more and more of that going on down here, especially in Southern and Central Arizona. Good question, great question. By the way, the last I also one for add, now. Go ahead. Okay, Shelby. No, you go ahead, I'll wait for. I might also add, uh, b besides these rising columns of air, especially at places like Boyce Thompson, and one of the reasons that those vultures spend so much time sitting on top of the cliffs is that as wind moves through, even before rising columns of air come up earlier in the morning, the wind hits those cliffs and is directed upward. So they can actually use that upward directed wind off the cliffs to get going early in the morning before these rising columns of air get going. So these, the Boyce Thompson community uh, turkey vultures can get out there and ready to feed much, much sooner than if they rely just on rising columns of air. Huh. So if redheads and blackheads are seen together, is that about age or different species? Okay, young turkey vultures for the first year or two years, depending on the sex, will have a dark, almost gray head. Uh, but they still have the silverish wing linings and they have the dihedral. The, the black-headed ones, the black vultures, if they're together with turkey vultures, and they do. At Leisure World, for instance, both black vultures and turkey vultures spend the whole year there. And uh, the black vultures have a very different body shape. And they'll have a black head all, all their life. Uh, young ones and old ones all always have a black head. Uh, so you have to distinguish. So some turkey vultures, when they're young, can have a dark head, but they have a very different body shape. Okay? Thank you. Good. Good questions. Now, here's the complicated turkey vulture distribution. Look at the range. Turkey vultures occur from southern Canada all the way down to Tierra del Fuego in Argentina. Uh, the yellow areas are where they spend the, the summers only. They're only down in the yellow areas during the summer. So in Argentina, that's December, January, and February. They're down there in the austral summer, getting way down to the Falkland Islands, down to Tierra del Fuego and Ushuaia. And the yellow areas in North America are only in our June, July, and August, uh, getting up to Minnesota and Southern Alberta and, and Washington and Vancouver. And again, uh, it's an interesting question. Why don't the vultures get much farther north? Well, again, it may well be that uh, uh, thermals, uh, access to food, uh, those are all problems. Why can you get so far in South America? Again, those are questions we don't have all the answers for. There's lots and lots of, of mysteries yet to, to solve. So those are fun questions to ask. But look, at, this gets more complicated because the Northern Hemisphere vultures move south to winter in South America. And the Southern Hemisphere turkey vulture population moves north in their winter. And this is what we get, this kind of movement. And again, they're not, the, these down here are, are, are moving uh, in, in uh, April, May, and June, uh, you know, March, April, and May, they're moving north to winter. And in March, April, May, ours are moving north to nest. Uh, how do they read the, the environment different? How do these know, okay, this is April, I need to stop uh, reproducing now, I need to head north. And, and these down here, April comes along and they're wintering down here, Oh, I have to start reproducing and I head north to nest. So they're heading north for, for completely different reasons. 
and you think of hormones would be all screwed up doing different things. Again, more mysteries of how these populations are the same species. Now, they're probably, these are different subspecies. These are separate populations and they don't interbreed. So someday they may be separate species. They may be cryptic species now, but they are now considered all one species. And uh, these are wintering in the, in the Amazon while these up here are way up here in the north. So they don't ever kind of cross and occur, uh, occur together. Again, gets fairly complicated. But again, do you all understand now why all these populations across North America all funnel down here? Why they can't go across the Gulf of Mexico? Remember, they can't go over oceans because oceans don't produce those rising columns of air for them to use. And they can't flap their wings for long periods. So they are restricted to move over land where they can depend on rising columns of air, either coming off of mountain cliff edges or rising columns of thermals coming off the surface of the, of the earth. And if you ever want to see 2 million turkey vultures in one day, go to Panama in October. Not, you know, you might have to wait till next year, but they're all funneled down. So all the turkey vultures from the interior of North America, from Western and Central North America, all of them funneled right down here. And where the land gets really narrow in Panama, they all pass through there in a matter of a couple of weeks. It's, it's just an amazing sight. The sky is literally black with turkey vultures. And you can see single flocks of 20 and 30 and 40,000 turkey vultures. It's just super, super impressive. Uh, some of them will winter, uh, uh, again, we're finding they're wintering farther and farther north uh, up in uh, up these areas. Again, apparently it's climate change. So it may be an indicator of climate change, but other populations will move all the way down here to winter in Venezuela and Colombia and, and parts of, of Central and, and, and uh, Middle America. In some ways, we're getting more questions than we have answers. Uh, we got so many more questions as we learn more and more about these turkey vultures. Uh, we're finding out, boy, how little we do know. And it helps us understand not just turkey vultures, but other birds as well, and other habitats and environments. So turkey vultures in some ways are ending up, ending up being kind of bioindicator species. We got a yeah. question from Facebook. Have you ever been to Panama to see them? Yes, I have. Yeah. And there's actually a, an old, uh, there's a hotel built up on a, on a tower and you can go up there and it, you can be almost in amongst the turkey vultures as you're moving through. It's really incredible. Uh, if you can't get to Panama, another good place to go uh, is the north rim of the Grand Canyon, where they tend to congregate at certain points to cross the canyon. Or you, if you live in Minnesota, go up to Duluth to Hawk Ridge. And there they can see thousands and thousands, not as many, but they can see thousands of turkey vultures there are also moving through, concentrating along the north shore of the Lake Superior. So anywhere you get that funnel effect, whether it's, whether it's the north, north shore of Lake Superior or certain points across the Grand Canyon, you're going to get some accumulation of these vultures waiting for the right time and lots of uh, flocks will move through. But nothing compares to Panama as far as I'm concerned, as far as the numbers. So turkey vulture conservation. One of the reasons that we don't have as much detail about vulture, turkey vultures as we do about, say, about the California condor or endangered species is, in general, this is the worst conservation problem turkey vultures have to, to, to face. When they're on the, on the road scarfing down a, a dead skunk and they've added three or four pounds to their, to their body weight, all of a sudden a car comes along, they can't just rise up on their wings and get out of the car's way. They have to run along into the wind and the car is coming from upwind, they have to run right into the car and try and get off the road. And this is probably one of the main mortalities of turkey vultures is being hit by vehicles because they cannot get off the road fast enough. Turkey vultures have learned one of the best places to find dead animals is along roads. And so they'll quite often actually seek the roads out and patrol them up and down. One of the trade-offs is if they, if they light down there and start to eat those things, especially as they, as they eat a lot and get heavier, they end up with this kind of problem. But it's one of the few conservation problems turkey vultures have. They're actually doing quite well. And as a result of their not being endangered or threatened, we have relatively little information on their life histories, on their movements. Uh, I mean, who marks a turkey vulture? Very few people are actually marking, they're doing some of it, but compared to a, a, a California condor where every individual is marked, 
uh, we know relatively little about the movements of individual tiger, uh, uh, turkey vultures and, and uh, overall their population numbers are doing quite well. The global population is about 18 million. That's our best guess. That's, that's far from, from danger. Again, we have to be careful about that because the passenger pigeon also had millions and millions of individuals and it went extinct. Just having a big population doesn't mean you're immune from extinction or problems. So we have to be a little careful there, but as we see it right now, turkey vultures have a very, very healthy population. And in some ways, seems to be growing with, with overwintering populations and, and expanding territories into farther, farther into Canada, for instance. One of the reasons that they're able to do so well, imagine what the immune system of vultures has got to be. Can you imagine their T cells and, and their, their antibodies what do they have that they can eat stuff that we, can you imagine eating a dead skunk off the road? What would it do to us? How long would we last? I mean, be, besides barfing, how many viruses and fungi and bacteria would you be ingesting? It would just be incredible. Yet look at these vultures, they thrive on it. And more and more people now, uh, physiologists are actually looking at tricky vulture immune systems, trying to figure out what is it they have in their immune system? Uh, what is it about their, their T cells and their antibodies? What is it about them that they can fight off these viruses and bacteria and fungi so effectively and, and, and get away with eating something that nobody else will? It's a great way to overcome outcome competition. And also try and think of our world without vultures. Can you imagine the litter along the roads of dead bodies that would be there? Uh, it would take a long, long time, especially in a desert dry heat for them to ever decompose. So again, another positive aspect of, of vultures and future studies, especially in this day and age of COVID and other things, thinking about immune systems and how we can improve our own immune systems by understanding immune systems of organisms like vultures that have, have really developed something super, something really super. Now we think of global climate change as being bad and it is bad in many ways, mainly because it is changing. It's making things different. With almost every change inevitably, some species suffer, but some species actually gain from it. I know it sounds tough. Climate change is not hurting all organisms. It's actually helping some organisms by warming things up, by expanding their ranges and their abilities to, to survive in a, in a broader area. And turkey vultures, unlike polar bears, which are suffering immensely from climate change, loss of ice, loss of food. There's no doubt that the population of polar bears are in big trouble with this climate change. But turkey vultures are able to expand their ranges easily from 30 to 350 square miles with no problem at all. And as the climate changes, their territories and home ranges can expand. They may be able to contract them and be more effective at finding enough food in a small enough area. We don't know. Uh, it's all kind of guesswork right now, but we do have evidence that they are not only expanding their wintering range like here in Southern Arizona, South Arizona, but how far north they can go into Canada is expanding. And forest fires up there are probably expanding grasslands and deciduous forest. Uh, all kinds of changes are coming, both caused by uh, directly by climate change and indirectly through fires and, and, and peat moss and things like that, uh, loss of, of uh, ice under, under the soil and things like that are all changing and making in many ways, the world advantageous for turkey vultures to expand. So again, this is a message. I know it, climate change generally gets a real bad rap and it is doing a lot of harm. I don't wanna ever minimize that. On the other hand, there are going to be some species that are gonna take advantage of it and expand and be able to do more as the climate changes and, and, and warms up. So again, turkey vultures can expand their ranges. They can do a lot more with climate change. Again, lots of messages in there. But looking at turkey vultures now, we've seen that they have a lot of positive impacts on us, not just as bird watchers, not just as, as enjoyment with aesthetics. I don't want to minimize that. Those are, those are, those are fun aspects of, of who we are and why we are and why we have interest in what's going on around us. They fit in very, very nicely to, to, to a wild world that deserves to, 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 be, to be appreciated. At the same time, we find uh, more and more people like in Ohio, not only here at uh, Boyce Thompson, uh, actually Hinckley, Ohio has had their 
Father Day going back even farther than Boyce Thompson has. And more and more places are actually celebrating vultures and, and quote unquote buzzards. We all know they aren't really buzzards, don't they? But anyway, uh, again, using turkey vultures is a great way for people who may not be, shall we say, super conservation minded, haven't really had a lot of interest in, in the outside world. This could be a, kind of a portal organism, a very, who would ever thought of a, a turkey vulture as being a, a, a charismatic organism that would draw people into understanding and appreciating and wanting to know more about the environment. But that is what's happening. And we can celebrate turkey vultures for a lot of ways, including things like this that were probably unexpected. And the future, uh, as more and more studies have done uh, on, on their immune systems, on how they fly, where they fly, how they expand, indicators, those are all extremely spectacular ways in which vultures, buzzards, if you will, are, are hopefully going to become more and more part of our world. So let's have some questions and answers. Wonderful. So we have one that came through. Leisure World is one of the retirement communities that vultures are prevalent. If they are grouped 25 to 30 on top of a house by a lake, would that be to eat insects in the gutters? Quote, I was told. Or why? That, that's a good observation. I might also add, uh, two years ago, we went through a big, a big to-do because a lot of the residents there at Leisure World were tired of lots of droppings on their houses. They didn't want the vultures there anymore. And we actually had meetings with the, with the, uh, the, the people in charge there at Leisure World, along with Fish and Game, about getting a permit to exterminate the buzzards, to get rid of them, both the black and turkey vultures there. Happily, other residents, and hopefully we had some effect here from Boyce Thompson, also were able to convince the administration there at Leisure World as well as fish and wildlife, that that was not a good idea, that maybe people could learn to live with the vultures and see it and appreciate them. And apparently that's what happened uh, because they're still there. It's one of the biggest winter roosts of vultures anywhere in the state. Uh, there's a couple of those in Southern Arizona that almost approached that. But um, as far as why they come back there, well, one thing is they're protected from their enemies at night. Raccoons and things like that are not as likely to be around the houses. Uh, it's also a little bit warmer there, uh, right around the houses. There may be lots of reasons. Also, all those tall eucalyptus, they don't, don't only perch in, on the houses, but they perch in the eucalyptus trees. So uh, they've established a place. And vultures have a, a social aspect to them that they spend the night together. It's a way of defending themselves. Even at Boyce Thompson, they'll, they'll perch together on the cliff edges or even better in the eucalyptus trees where the bobcats and, and raccoons and other, other uh, predators can't get to them as easily. And by roosting in groups, they can warn each other. If you're roosting all by yourself and you're asleep, you don't stand a chance. But if there's 20 others around you, someone's going to spot that predator coming in or be, be disturbed and the rest of them will know right away. So that's probably why they're together. And once they establish a roost, they keep coming back. It, it becomes historically important to them. They learn that roost they come back to it and they gather more and more individuals come and join it. Young ones from the next year come and join. Whether they're eating the insects through other gutters, that's a possibility, but they don't really need to do that to use this as a roosting, a nocturnal roosting site. Uh, we had actually encouraged the administration if they absolutely had to get rid of the vultures, the best way was to do it was to use high pressure water hoses late in the afternoon and evening as they came in to roost. And, and just push them off the, off the, with water, push them off the, the roost. And they would learn after a week or so, this was not a good place to come to roost and they'd go to, to some other place, hopefully. Uh, you'd have to keep it up because they would start to come back after a while. They've got good memories. They really can learn well. So I would say that's probably more likely why they're there. It's a social system protecting themselves from predators more than anything else. Another one. So while they don't have a voice box, are they able to communicate with each other and how? Yes, good question. Uh, they will hiss at enemies. They have hissing air escaping their lungs. But they communicate uh, through courtship with the amount of, uh, of blood flowing in the head. Uh, the males, for instance, can communicate their, their, their readiness for mating by how bright red their head is. Even females, the, the brightness of the head will, will brighten up 
when they're around a, a dead animal and they want to say, I'm dominant here, you stay away, you see their head get redder. So they're communicating with the color of the head. They can communicate with their, with their wings being spread, their body language, just like you and I. We use body language all the time, uh, uh, facial expressions as well. We use them more than you really realize, they're often subconsciously. And vultures have some very, very uh, small and large ways of, of using their body language to communicate very effectively what they do and do not want or like. Do they go back to the exact same nesting area every year? Another good question. We don't have a lot of vultures marked. Again, because it's such a common bird, there hasn't been as much pressure to do the kind of studies we see on the more endangered species. But from the few bandings we have done, young ones sometimes don't go back to the same area at all. Uh, when they're returning, they are often in flocks and they will follow other unrelated vultures. They, they give up on their parents and follow other vultures and end up some places very, very different. So right now, that an to answer that question is very difficult. We, got, we have very ambiguous data uh, indicating uh, where the young ones go. Do the young ones come back? Now the adults, quite often the adults will come back. And we don't even know for sure, do they mate for life? Does the same male always mate with the same female? Do they come back together? Uh, we don't know. Uh, it may be the female comes back to the same nesting site time after time, and whatever males around that she chooses, and it's the females in charge of choosing, that's who will be the male. They're monogamous for sure, but whether, whether, whether we're called serial monogamy, that they, they have a different mate every year, uh, those are things that uh, are not quite clear yet. So turkey vultures aren't impacted by lead like the California condors and raptors have been? Uh, we don't see the lead effect so much with vultures. Uh, it's certainly, boy, the California condors, uh, when they would eat deer that had been shot with shotguns or with, uh, with bullets that had lead in them, the lead poisoning was spectacularly bad. It may well be, uh, well, again, I have to shake my head and wave my arm and, and, and indicate they may be affected by lead, but there's just so many of them, uh, we aren't able to pick it up and, they, and they are, they are, they're being lost. They, their bodies don't last very long. It's true of most birds. Uh, when they die, uh, they are so small and they're hollow bones, uh, they really disappear very, very quickly when, when they uh, decompose. Uh, and the people aren't following, the California condors, people were following individuals, all the individuals were marked. So they knew exactly what was happening to every single individual. We don't know that with the vultures. Uh, I'm guessing with the numbers and how they're growing, that they actually may have some immunity against the lead. That's a possibility too, but it's just a guess. So while they aren't endangered, are they protected from sport hunting or reducing the population in areas where people don't want them? Exactly. And that's why Leisure World had to involve uh, both the state and the feds because they are migratory birds protected by the Migratory Bird Act. If they cross state borders, then uh, they're both protected by the state laws and the federal laws. And no, you cannot shoot vultures. And you, you, there are some places that have gotten permits to, to get rid of the vultures by killing them. But it's a very exceptional thing. Uh, and it doesn't happen very often. Uh, the feds are pretty strict about letting that go. It's a lot easier to get people used to whitewash on their houses. Um, another comment, turkey vultures here in Leisure World also have heat from I-60 to create the columns that allow them to soar. Good point. That's, a, that's an excellent point too. The, 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 uh, the black, usually, usually the black rubberized asphalt uh, can provide usually earlier in the day so are the vultures along the freeway because they have uh, more rising air or is it because there's more dead things along the, along the uh, freeway? Maybe a combination of both things. Good point. What are some more of their natural predators? As adults, again, uh, they, they are at night the, the, uh, when they're roosting, they can have problems with bobcats, with raccoons, uh, sometimes with coyotes if they're roosting close to the ground. Uh, so that's for, for the adults, it's mainly at night. They don't have much problem during the daytime and they're so effective with that projectile vomiting. Most organisms, it's like a skunk. You get sprayed by that terrible, terrible vomit. Uh, you know once, uh, I'm, a, I'm a young young raccoon and I thought a vulture was an easy thing to get. I got sprayed, I'm never gonna get near them again. So they learn very, very quickly. Uh, so 
uh, I would say probably the, the biggest problem are with the chicks and the young ones, uh, both parasites and like other organisms, uh, vultures have trouble using the same nest over and over again because nest parasites begin to accumulate. And the nest parasites can become so common after a couple of years, they overwhelm the young ones. They suck the blood and do all kinds of things. So they have to move the nest. So I'd say those are probably the main problems uh, with, with parasites and, and, and uh, predators on vultures. Is there a hierarchy in flocks that roost together and when they leave and return, uh, when they leave and return to leisure world, they go one at a time? Yes, that's a great point. Uh, there's certainly what we call a dominance hierarchy. I want to kind of avoid jargon words. It's called a dominance hierarchy or pecking, pecking order is another word, the pecking order. And when you, at Boyce Thompson, you find the safest place for a vulture to spend the night is in those tall, tall eucalyptus trees. Those cliffs are not a good place to spend the night. They're very susceptible. And if you look early in the morning, most of the vultures that are on the cliffs, even though it's a preferable place to be to take off, and I go to spend the night, many of the young ones are on the cliffs. They aren't allowed to, to, to roost in the, in the uh, eucalyptus trees. It's mostly the adults, the older adults that get to the eucalyptus trees and have the dominance. Now the, the adults will move over to the cliffs in the morning because they can take off easier from the from the cliffs than from the from the uh, eucalyptus trees in most days. Okay, any other questions, Shelby? Sorry, I think I froze. Is okay. the vulture immune system inherited or developed over time? As far as we know, uh, it certainly has a strong genetic component, but I am guessing, knowing how it what little I do about immune systems and physiology, that as they are exposed to more and more different types of, of viruses and bacteria and fungus, uh, that they probably develop more antibodies and more T cells. So I would say it's a combination of having extremely strong genetic predisp predisposition to handle those, and then they can learn, their, their immune system learns as it goes along. We have a question from Facebook. Are their lungs being affected by the fires out west? Oh. Well, there, I'm only guessing on this now. I don't know, I don't know if we have any data on that. Uh, birds in general have a much more efficient respiratory system than we do, much more. That's why I can fly at 30,000 feet. Uh, our lungs are very inefficient because they're dead end sacs. We have this dead air that we can't get rid of at the end of our, end of our lungs. Vultures have these extra tubes that actually run through the, through, from the lungs and produce a flow through system. So they're not, there's not dead air, they're actually uh, flowing through. And I'm guessing with that flow through system that the smoke can accumulate like it can in our lungs and really do st strong damage by being in involved, what we call that, that tidal air, that, that, that dead air at the end of our lungs where that smoke sits there, can really do damage to our alveoli and other parts of our lungs. And the vultures, I'm guessing, with a flow through system like birds have, uh, there's not as much chance for the smoke to sit and actually reside right next to the alveoli and other, other important components of the lungs. Uh, guessing, uh, I'm guessing that they, they're probably impacted, but not as much as human beings would be. And then last question, unless any last minute ones come through, why are other birds able to fly over water? Uh, great question. Remember I referred to the flight of the vultures as static soaring, they're using rising air. Well, albatross, and other birds over the ocean also use soaring, but it's called dynamic soaring. Here we get into another bit of physics. Uh, they can't use rising air. So what they do is it turns out that the air right over the surface of the ocean is slowed by, down by friction because it's actually touching the surface of the ocean. So the air right next to the ocean is slower than the air up higher. And on fixed wings, what the, what the albatross can do is they can take advantage of and they have heavy bodies. They all weigh 15. 20 pounds, they're much, much bigger. They have much longer, thinner wings. And what they do is they will soar and they'll actually come from high speed wind and, and, and soar down to lower, close to the ocean where the, where the wind is slower. And they'll turn and then face into the wind and, and they'll actually start to rise. And as they rise, they're getting into faster and faster and faster winds. And they keep circling like that. They'll keep circling by using that differential in the amount of winds called dynamic soaring. So uh, that's how they're going. Great. And then one last thing. Oh, it's not a question. Thank you from all of us. Time well spent.
It was fun. And finally, uh, yeah, welcome back, Buzzards Day 2021, okay? We are hopeful. Well, thank you, Dr. Pearson, for sharing this uh, information with everyone this morning. Like the comment said, definitely time well spent. Um, we appreciate you pivoting to the virtual route. Um, and hopefully, like we said in the spring, we'll be able to be in person and actually see some of those turkey vultures up on Magma Ridge. Here's keeping our fingers crossed. Okay. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in to learn a little bit more and celebrate our virtual Bye Bye Buzzard event. Another thank you coming through. Alrighty, we'll see you later. Okay, bye. Thanks a lot.